Um, as we get started, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, the Word is all about You. And Lord, all we want to do is, uh, Lord, we want to learn today. We want to be uh, disciplined disciples, learners, Father, so that um, we can go forth and use what it is that You've put in us. Just like the Word came forth today to go, go, go. Yeah. And do what it is that God has called us to do to, um, you know, to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. And we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. All right, guys. What I wanted to uh, tell you today is um, I want to take you back to um, I want to take you back to Elijah and Elisha, right? Yeah. Remember that um, there are pictures and uh, of Elijah and Elisha that uh, point out Christ. Right? It's about God the Father and the Son. Now, why are we learning this? What are we learning it for? It's so that you can use it to show others how awesome, how amazing, how, you know, unfathomable that God is in His depths. And, and in it, we learn not only what was going on back then, the surface, but also how it applies to us right now and what's coming. And this is what uh, the power of God is so that we can understand. So what I'm going to do today is remember I brought you and started you out in 1 Kings chapter 17. We was talking about Elijah and Elisha. And I was showing you how Elijah and his Elisha, how their lives parallel. And how their picture of Elijah, God the Father, Elisha, um, you know, God the Son, right? Elijah, his name means Yahweh is God. And Elisha, his name means Yahweh is salvation. Jesus, Yeshua, his name means literally salvation. So when you call upon the name of Yeshua, you're calling upon salvation. And I showed you, you're going to see in the stories... Everything is going to be, you know, it's pretty amazing that Elisha only does what he sees his father do, right? So you're going to see the same thing with Christ, only doing what he sees his father do. So it's a mere image of one another. Therefore, we should be doing exactly what Jesus did, exactly what God did. So that's what we've been called to do. This is not... Um, information just so you to store in your information bank so that you know mm -hmm. you might say well I know this and I know that but it's for application yes. meaning when you leave man if if God has spoke to you in any kind of way shape or form about something that's come forth share it with somebody share it with somebody because all we are is conduits we allow the, war, the word just to flow through all of us. So um, don't miss the opportunity to, man, let me tell you this. Let me, let me show you this really quick. And if they receive it, they receive it. And if they don't, you never know. A door can open up, man, and you just start pouring into them, which uh, would be some amazing stuff. I showed you and I told you before, last week God had spoke to me um, to give that message that by David Wilkerson. Um, that was definitely an in-season right on time word meaning that God was speaking you'll hear a voice speaking behind you telling you to do this or do that also this was uh, last Saturday also listen to in the prophecy that was the that came forth today about it's a new beginning right it's a new beginning it's a new time it's the time to go forth and be sent and so you know what does that mean as a whole well whatever it is that God has placed in you use it you know wherever you are at you know look for an open door I know um, if you're not looking for an open door you're not gonna find one you know what I mean you have to be looking especially with this kind of information with it because it's life and you see it when you know you find somebody that you're gonna know who's hungry feed the hungry if they're not hungry don't feed them right don't feed them don't chase them you'll know if God opens a door for you and it might just be sharing a little something a little something a little something then before you know it you know if they got your attention or not because they're like dead focused in on you like man zoned in on every word that's and that's that ground it's being planted in yeah. that's what you sow it into so back to Elijah I was showing you how 
Elijah and Elisha was both a picture of God the Father and the Son. And, um, and you see what Elijah does. Elijah's life is going to mirror Jesus' life. Because Jesus is God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit and one earthen vessel. Right. And this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Elijah, he represents the old covenant. Okay? That's what he... And what is that? He's going to return the hearts uh, of the fathers back into the children and the children into the fathers. That's, you know, why? Because the whole thing nowadays is to break the family apart. Right? Well, Elijah's ministry was to come and, you know, uh, preach to the southern kingdom, Judah, to bring them back to God. The northern kingdom, you know, uh, had already... I'm sorry, nor Yes, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, which was Israel, had already fell. They were gone, right? And they, Judah held in there, I think it was another hundred and something years. Well, at the time, you got Elijah and Elisha preaching to this kingdom. Elijah, Elisha, uh, Amos, and Hosea. That was the four prophets that were sent to the southern kingdom. And uh, at the end of Elisha's life is when... Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar comes and besieges the city and destroys the temple around 586. So this is all taking place. Elijah and Elisha's life is taking place around 100 years before the destruction of the temple. And they're preaching to, you know, uh, a nation that has fell into idolatry and fornication, Baal worship, and just all kind of things that got them away. And remember in the story, you know, Elijah comes up and he says, look, you know, this is the part we was actually getting to. The first part of Elijah in 1 Kings 16 and 17 was I showed you exactly how Elijah raised the dead boy, the widow, remember? Remember a widow? He goes to a widow's house. She has a son. He dies. Elijah, whose name means Yahweh is God, brings him to the upper room, lays on him, spread out three times in the shape of a cross, raises him from the dead. This is all a picture of Christ. And then he presents the dead woman, uh, I mean the dead boy, who's now alive, to the widow woman. And I showed you how, in that story, how Mary was a widow, and Christ, three days and three nights, resurrected. You know, you see all of these pictures. This is the power that shows beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is who he says he is. You can't get around this. This is what shakes people to their core. That wow, there's, I mean, how can this be happening? This ain't Jesus setting this up, or in, well, in a way it is because he's God, but as a man, he couldn't have anything to do with this, what's going on. You follow me? As a man. And it all points to Christ. And the next thing you see is Elijah, it, it's a part of the end time. Because Elijah is going to be a reflection of the end, which we're going to see. But the, the story of Elijah, you're going to see it's about the first coming of Christ and about the second coming. So in that story, and then it's going to be passed on to Elisha, which is absolutely amazing, which we might touch on just a little bit. But here it is, the first scene we get with Elijah, they all know in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, it says Elijah must come before, you know, uh, the Lord. So they're supposed to be looking for Elijah, you know, and here it is, Elijah shows up on a scene. First thing, he, his ministry is to bring the hearts uh, of the children and the fathers back together again, right? Why? Because the fathers have forsaken the children. That's, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all those that's in the temple. They ain't worried about the kids. Nor the kids, is, they ain't even bringing nothing to the temple anymore, right? It's, uh, uh, so what's happening, Elijah, you know, in his regular life, his ministry was that we know of is about three and a half years. So we know that's a picture of the last, you know, last three and a half years in the tribulation. Pretty amazing. So you get this picture of Elijah, you know, uh, coming, staying at a widow woman's uh, house in Zidon, and which means fishery. Uh, um, the boy dies. I told you how it was in the feast time that he raised him, and all the resurrections were in the feast of the Lord. Um, and then uh, presents the boy back. And now... Uh, when Elijah came, he said there was going to be no rain for three and a half years, so there's a great famine. So we know in the end there's going to be a great famine. And then, um, you know, now he says he brings, if God, he appears 
to one of uh, Ahab's servants and tells him, listen, who, remember I showed you how it all happened on Pentecost. He hid 50 in one cave and 50 in the other. Remember I was tying all of it in. If you haven't seen it, go back and look at it the week before last. Um, keep you up. I told you guys to go and read it if you could. So he hides them in there by 50, so you get the spirit, I mean, you get this, um, this message of God showing us, you know, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when it's actually happening. And then um, he tells uh, Ahab's servant that, you know, behold, Elijah is here. Right? That Elijah, his name means God. This is all a picture of what's exactly going to happen in the end. And then um, he tells Ahab to gather up, you know, the, all the prophets and bring them to Mount Carmel. And he says, look, gather them all together. If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. So here it is on Mount Carmel, which overlooks the Valley of Megiddo, right? Where it all happens in the end. Here it is, Elijah, you know, uh, they set up an altar to Baal, 450 prophets. And then, um, then Elijah sets up an altar. But in this confrontation, right, you know, he tells all the prophets, look, you know, you set up an altar and they set it up in the morning. And he said, you call out to the, uh, your God and the God that answers by fire. That was another connection to the Holy Spirit. The God that answers by fire. He's true God. So either you're going to serve God or serve Baal. Mm -hmm. And he, in fact, he was calling out he, to the children of Israel. If you're going to serve God, because he's what is what is he doing? He's returning the hearts of the children back to the Father. Amen. That's what he's doing. That's what Elijah came to do. So in setting up these two altars, remember, uh, they set an altar up and, um, you know, they called on to God from morning to noon to where they was even cutting their self and then jumping on the altar and blood was gushing out and, and then Elijah starts mocking him. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's doing something and he can't hear you, right? That's what's happening in 1 Kings 17 and 18. And then uh, at the end of the evening uh, sacrifice. So this is setting up a time, you know, in God's feast when he's doing this. Because this is all a picture of the end and what's going to happen. How is it a picture of the end? You're going to see that Elijah represents judgment, right? That's why they believe he's going to be the one that returns in the end. So here it is on, you know, on Mount Carmel, which overlooks the valley of Megiddo. Remember, he sets up the altar because that's where it all ends at. The Lord returns. There's a great army that God gathers up, you know, where the blood flows to the horse's bridle. And um, it all takes place there. This is a little bitty clip shot picture of what's going to happen in the end that we can gather. So they build it and, you know, nothing happens. And, and at the evening offering, sacrifice, Elijah, he does some pretty key things. And he calls, uh, he, don't, he, don't, he says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, he don't say Jacob, he says Israel. Wow. Now, Jacob is subplanner, which means to go for before in Israel. His name means a prince with God. And when he said Israel, it was because God gave, he gave birth to the 12 sons or the 12 tribes. So Jacob as, Jacob as a man working in Laban's house for Rachel and Leah, he's not Israel yet until he wrestles with God. God touches the hollow of his socket. He says, bless me, right? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to change your name. Wow, a big blessing. God changes your name. There's a big blessing in it. And Jesus did the same thing. So you start connecting all of these little dots. You start seeing something. And here it is, at this place, it says, he took the, the stone, the, the 12 stones that was, you know, scattered around for each tribe, rebuilds the altar. Why? Because he's calling on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, Yahweh, the one true God. He builds this altar of 12 stones, and you can follow that through the kingdom, through the, the word. And then he puts wood on it. And then he digs a trench around it, right? And remember I said that trench, he pours, he takes um, uh, 
four buckets and pours it on there. Four, right? Do it again. Do it again. Twelve buckets of water is poured on twelve stones. And all of this is for purpose. You're going to notice um, that uh, in it, um, you know, when Elijah flees and runs from Jezebel, he goes to uh, Beersheba, the place of seven wells. He told uh, the ser his servant to go run and look when rain. Tell Ahab uh, that, uh, you know, rain's coming, right? And he made him go run and look to the, uh, toward the, the east, I mean toward the west at the Mediterranean Sea. Do you see anything? No. And he came back. And he did it seven times. And on the seventh time he saw a hand. Remember that? And then he said, you go tell him that uh, hurry up and go because rain's coming. But you get, you get the seven. He goes to a well of uh, Beersheba, which is a, uh, seven wells, which means oath. Then he goes and he sees the number seven. You guys, this is important because of what I'm teaching you on Wednesday nights about the numbers and the colors and all this kind of stuff. Because, you know, it, it's seven. It's completion. It's rest. Same thing with Christ. And then what does he say when he goes on 40 days and 40 nights when he fasts, brings him to Mount Horeb, right? I alone, I, 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 you know, I'm the last prophet. No, you're not. There's 7,000 more. In, in a couple of chapters, seven, seven, seven. You st and all of a sudden these things start seven years of tribulation, seven bowls, seven vials, seven trumpets. All of this stuff, it's there for a reason. So that, like, you know, Charlene says, you know, that I'm the dot connector. So that you can connect the dots to see what it is that's going on. After him killing 450 prophets of Baal, right? Cut all of their heads off, right? Serious stuff. The next thing you see, Jezebel, surely as I'm, you, what you did today, by tomorrow, you're going to be the same way. He runs off and hides. He's scared. I mean, you see who's supposed to be a mighty man, right? Next thing you know, he's scared. That's just like you and I. Yeah. You know where then, this really blew me away because of everything that's going on. Who appears to him? Gabriel, an angel, a messenger. And I'll get into that afterwards. I'll tie it in for you to show you how it's Gabriel, the angel that appears to him. <laughs> um, so anyway, and he feeds him, you know? And uh, he's gotta go on that uh, food twice he's fed for 40 days so he winds up at Mount Horeb where the split rock is the same cave that Moses went in so Moses goes up receives the law where does he go he goes to the same place because Moses and Joshua Elijah and Elisha John and Jesus you're gonna see this pattern that repeats there so he goes there and God says, what are you doing? You know, well, surely she's going to kill me. He says, no, i got 7,000 more like you. And, and then God gives him a command. And that's what we're going to pick up. God gives Elijah a command and, um, to go and anoint um, kings, uh, these two kings, and anoint Elisha. This is where, I mean, things get really amazing. Um, so when you want to go, you know, share something with somebody and, and man, let me show you this, how amazing this is. You can go right back and show them Christ's life in Elijah and Elisha. Now I'm going to tell you again, please, I just went really fast through Elijah's, you know, uh, like three or four chapters of Elijah's life. Um, and I'm going to bring you to Elisha. But, um, you know, uh, I want you to go back and read it. Um, and see what you can glean from it. Because what you're looking for is Jesus. So why? So you can show others. So this is what I wrote. While I'm, I'm going to show you Elijah and Elisha, and I'm going to start here in 1 Kings, but then I'm going to bring you into the New Testament, and I'm going to read a bunch of scriptures to you to show you just um, some amazing things. Um, while Elijah is a figure of John, the Baptist. That's what Jesus said, yeah. right? Uh, it's in Matthew uh, chapter 11, verse 4, chapter 17, verse 10. We're going to read that. And uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, Elisha reminds us of Christ. 
right? So while Elijah is a figure of John the Baptist, Elisha is a figure of Jesus Christ. Where Elijah generally lives apart from the people, right? And stresses law and judgment and repentance. Who else did that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He lived apart from the people. Yes, he did. Why? What do they represent? The law. The law. John was a Levite. His father was Zechariah, serving in the temple. John represents the law. The law, it's, it's separated. You're separated because of God's law, because, right? Because of sin, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The law, there's only a certain way that Christ can dwell amongst us in a sanctuary. You, you understand? Yeah. So that's why John lives separated. Because he is coming now to bring the hearts of the people back to the fathers. So where Elijah generally uh, lives apart from the people and stresses law, judgment, and repentance, Elisha, he lived among the people. Wow. He lived among the people, and his emphasis, Elisha's life, was on grace, life, and hope. Jesus. On Jesus. I mean, just amazing. So let's do this. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 11. And by going back, we're going into the light now. So going into the New Testament, this is light. This is going to help us understand more, you know, in the shadow. And we're going to glean from both, which is going to give us more information. Why? Because what's coming. Because what happened then is going to happen again, just like then. So we know what to look for. So Matthew chapter 11. In verse 14, it says, um, I'm going to go up a little bit, and I'm going to start in verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say uh, to the multitudes concerning John. Now, let me go up to verse 2. Let me, yeah, yeah, I got to. You know how it is. I'm going to start in verse 1. Okay. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed then to teach and to preach in their cities. This is, notice how it stops here, okay? Because, you know, John's ministry, Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. John's ministry was three and a half years. There's a break here. Elijah's ministry was for three and a half years. So if Elijah's ministry is three and a half years, John's ministry is three and a half years. We know that John was six months older than Christ, right? He preparing the way and all of that. So there's a break right here. And um, in verse 2 it says, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Man, he's the one that God said, the he's seen the bird land, the dove land on him. He's the one pointing it out, right? But here he is in prison, and now you see the man of John, filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb at the coming of Christ. Right? right? Right. So here it is. And he said unto him, and this is very important that we're going to connect these dots. Watch. Because, I'm going to tell you again this, John is a Levite. John knows the law. John writes it, studies it. I mean, he knows it. So Jesus naturally is going to, you know, speak to him through it. Watch. He says, And he said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Right? Uh, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's in Isaiah. John's going to know that, right? So he's reaffirming John through the word. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft remnant? Behold, 
they that wear soft clothing or in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Listen. If we have no old covenant, we have no way being prepared for Jesus Christ. So how do we even know if we don't have it? Who he says he is. Right? So we know we can go back and look to see if Jesus is who he says he is. Because the way has been prepared. And that's what we're looking at. All of the ways that's been prepared has been laid out for him to come. Right? Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He's even greater than Elijah. Wow. None greater than John. Right? Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why? The kingdom of heaven, Jesus preached that all who fall under the new covenant. John fell under the old covenant. So... The least in the kingdom that fell under the blood sacrifice of Yeshua is greater than John. Wow, pretty amazing. And he says, And from the days of John the Baptist unto now. Listen to this. From the days of, and from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Oh, glory to God. And the violent take it by force Hallelujah. unto the days, from the days of John the Baptist unto now. Because that time period is now ending. Ending. Christ now is going to die and he's going to seize, take the keys back and it's finished. It's done. Right? And from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John... And if you will receive it, this is Elijah which was to come. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. So, he's letting you know, John was the Elijah to come. Now go, I'm going to go to uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. Matthew 17, 10 through 12. I'm probably going to have to go up. Um, now... In reading this, this is very important, right here, what I'm fixing to show you, because the spirit of Elijah brings the return of Christ. Watch the connections. Every time you see John or Elijah being mentioned, it's about Christ's coming, right? And you're going to see how, and literally read it, where it physically says that he's going to, Elijah must come again. But notice the... Um, it, Matthew chapter 17 is the transfiguration, right? Where he's transfigured and his clothes was white as remnant. And here it is, Peter, James, and John, they want to build three sukkahs, three tabernacles, right? So the setting of what I'm about to read to you in verse 10, chapter 17, verse 10, is about his coming. Same setting, right? It's about his coming. Elijah prepares the way of the Lord and he says... Um, Verse 10, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you, that's twofold right there. Elijah is already come. So watch. The verses above it speaking of his second coming. Right? Let's read it again. Watch. I'm going to go up. And after six days, why six days? After 6,000 years. Um, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. Because the two verses right above it, this is the context of it. 27 and 28 of chapter 16. For the Son of Man shall come in glory of his Father with the angels, and shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here that shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. After six days, he taketh Peter, James, and John, and they up on a high mountain, he's transfigured. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone as the sun, and his remnant was white as a light. This is all a picture of what he's going to look like when he returns, right? After six days or six thousand years, and behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah, 
are taken with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us uh, make thee uh, three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, right, Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright, cloud, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice from the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And they came down from the mountain, and Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? First come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah already is come, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall they do unto the Son of Man. And the disciples understood that they were speaking of John the Baptist. Now I'm going to look at um, Luke chapter 1, verse 17. Go through a couple of scriptures before I tie it in for you guys. Luke 1. Luke 1, 17. It says, um, Luke 1, 17, it says, um, many of children show, okay, let me go up. I'm going to go to verse 11. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fell upon him. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and uh, thou shalt call his name John. Pretty amazing. We started off at the altar of incense. This is where he was when, uh, when he was offering incense on the altar. When the Lord, when the angel Gabriel, right, man of God, appeared to him and told him that a child was going to be born. This is what he was doing. They was waiting for him to come out. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Wow. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer today. Yes. Wow. Man, it just kind of went through me. Yeah. And thy wife, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, her name means oath or covenant. Check that out now. John is a picture of the old covenant. Elizabeth's name means covenant or oath. Right? He shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou uh, shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That's what he was doing, right? That, listen. That's what the Word does. The Old Covenant brings us back into relationship with God. It shows us who we are, we're sinful, and we need a Savior. So the Old Covenant points to Jesus. John, I am the voice of the one in the wilderness, make straight the pathway, points to Jesus. The Word is what brings us back. You understand? That's the mere reflection of what's happening. And he shall go forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's going forth. Elijah's name means Yahweh is God. John's name means well-beloved. Wow. John's name, beloved, is going forth in the spirit of God. Just like Christ. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Word of God in the end is going to prepare us for the coming of the Lord. That's the only thing that's going to do it. Right? I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to read Malachi chapter 3 now. Watch this. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. He says, and what this is now, I'm going to tie in some 
um, because what's happening, Jesus in his speaking, I'm giving, I'm going to give you now the scriptures where he's pointing to that John is who he says he is and that it's going to happen in the end. It's going to repeat itself. So watch this. Um, Malachi chapter 3 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Wow. This is amazing because it's not only speaking of John, but it's speaking of his return as well. Exactly what's going to happen in the end. And he says, Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? Man, this is, you know, um, the second coming. And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like the refiner's fire and like the fuller's uh, sop. And he shall set as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Right? That's redemption. Remember we're learning in the thing? Yeah. So here it is. What he's saying. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Redemption. He's the one that's going to have the redemption. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. Not an old offering. This is new offerings now. Right? That ain't old covenant offerings. We bring a sacrifice of praise. This is new covenant. The old covenant with John preparing the way. Now we're going to bring an offering of righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages and the widow and the far fatherless and they that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me saith the Lord of hosts so here it is this is a direct connection that Jesus is making with John the Baptist preparing the way for what he's exactly gonna do right so now um, look at uh, Malachi 4 verse 4 watch what he says Malachi 4.4 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto you in Horeb for all of Israel, the statutes and the judgments? Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. His first coming wasn't like that. Right? His first coming wasn't like that. Listen to the connection that he's making. I'm going to read it again. So now he's talking about Elijah's coming, or he's talking about the return of the Lord. Here comes the connection when he's coming. Remember ye the law of Moses, the servant. When was that given? On Pentecost. He's making the connection. You understand? Yeah. It's when it was given. And he says, Which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all of Israel, with the statutes and the judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite thee the earth with a curse. I'm going to look at uh, this other verse, Isaiah 40. You don't have to return, you don't have to turn to it. Isaiah 40, verse 3. Here's another connection to it. And this is building line upon line and precept upon precept to understand what it is that God's going to do. Because now, by doing this, this is laying the groundwork so that when you go back and read the story of Elijah, it lays out plain for you. Because you can see what's going to happen and what's going to go down now that you know it all applies to his first and second coming. And 40 verse 3. He says, uh, he says, um, the voice of one that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert highway for our God. Watch, next verse. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and every crooked path shall be made straight. The rough places 
plain. This is his second coming. This is what happens when he sets one foot. Now, and now I can even take you to Zechariah, you know, when he does come and the mountain cleaves and he puts one foot on it. Um, let's see. Um, Isaiah 29, 18. You know, when, um, when you start laying something out, this is what's actually, when I start reading, if you know the stories, this is what starts running through your head, where you start connecting the dots. You're like, oh my God, wow, 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 right? He says, Isaiah um, 29, verse 18 says, um, He says, verse 18, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall uh, see out of obscurity and out of darkness. You know, it's pretty amazing because uh, Zechariah, because he didn't believe God or believe Gabriel, the message, he was deafened, right? Because he represented the law. Gabriel's name means man of God. Zechariah, you're going to have a son. Well, now here it is. An angel of the Lord has appeared before him, Gabriel, a messenger. Tells him what's going to happen, and he still don't believe. He wants a sign. A wicked and adulterous generation. And he says, therefore, you're going to be deaf and dumb. You're not going to be able to speak, and all they can do is write. Right? Um, Luke chapter 7. What I'm going to do is, I think I'm only going to be able to go through these scriptures with you today and then I'm gonna have to then we're gonna go back into Elijah's life. What time is it? If you, what time is it? Yeah, this is it. I'm gonna read, read this last scripture. So what I'm gonna do is now that I brought you back into the New Testament and showing you um, I'm gonna encourage you to go back and read and I'm gonna show you where um, and see what you can glean out of it. Next week when we come back now I'll be able to take you into the story and begin to read the story to you and really just begin to break it down and point some really good things out. So Luke chapter 7 verse 11. I'm sorry guys, it was long. We didn't get into uh, you know, uh, what I really wanted to get to today, but it's, it's all good. Um, let's see. Uh, Luke chapter 7 verse 11 through 22. It says, um, I'm going to start in 10. Um, uh, Christ secretly goes to the feast. I mean, uh, nope. I'm in John 7. I'm sorry. Luke, wrong one. Luke 7. Lukey 7. Lukey 7. Luke. Luke chapter 7. Yeah. Verse 11. Here we go. All right. And it came to pass the day after that he went into the city called Nain, which means pleasant, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he had came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. Sound familiar? <laughs> Watch. Um, the she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord, Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Wow, that word compassion, right? The Good Samaritan. And he had compassion on him. That represents, you know, the Lord. And he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bearer. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young woman, I mean young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up. Now, notice... He's being carried. He's lifted. Wow. They carried him. That's how they carried him. Put him on their shoulders. Passed the boy through him. Right? They carry him. This boy represents Christ. Understand? The widow. It's amazing. And he said... Um, and he came and touched the bearer, and they that bear him stood still. That's the word that came forth today, right? Stand still. Be still, be still, be still. 
Be still and we'll get our healing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Be still and trust and have faith. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came uh, a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying, That a great prophet is risen up among us. And that God hath visited his people. Should I? Yeah, 11 through. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can keep reading. And this rumor... And this rumor of him went forth throughout all of Judea and throughout all of the region round about. And the disciples of John showed uh, him all of these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples uh, sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come, or, to we look, or should we look for another? That is crazy. It's crazy. John asking him that. After he points him out, after the direct word from God, he says, the one you see the Spirit and lighting on, it's him. He points him out. Now, he's sending disciples to go ask him if it's him. Then in prison, he's, you know, is it him? Is it really him? So you see in the humanity side, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. How many of you do it? I do it. We all do it. I'm like, you know, I got a battle. Man, Lord. Did you really tell me to do this? Yeah. Right? Right. Is this really? Give me a sign. Yeah. You know? And um, both, both of them see that is from heaven and still doubt it. That's exactly right. Both of them saw that. Zachariah and his father and John. That's exactly right. And he knew he was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. Right. You know? So it's... Uh, Man, the battle's there. Oh, yeah. Believe me. I mean, the enemy, first thing that comes in is doubt. We know it's the enemy. Oh, yeah. Did God really call you to do this? You know? Yeah. You know, and let me tell you something. This is how the Lord works. Um, let me read this and I'm, I'll be done. And John, calling unto to his disciples, sent them to Jesus and said, All thou him, or shall we look for another? When the men uh, were come unto him, they said, uh, John the Baptist had sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or we look for another. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues of, every, of, of the evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto him, This is very important, which I'm about to tell you. He said unto them, Go your way. And tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor receive the gospel. That's Isaiah 60, right? But listen, what is the witness? The witness is the word. The witness is not, it's in the sign. But what is the witness to John? Because the word said, when the Messiah would come, this is what's going to happen. So now, he's telling John, the things you see. Now, you go tell John that what he's read and believed, it's true. Because the word confirms what's happening. You understand? So if you don't have the word, what kind of confirmation you're going to have as to what the sign is? There'd be nothing, right? Um, and I'm gonna stop. My, um, you know, I'm asking the Lord. Check this out. This is how He works. I'm asking the Lord. You know, just like this. Did you call me to do this? Right? I already know it. Lord, just you know, tell me. I'm just, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Right? This is what I'm asking the Lord. What do you want me to do? I get a phone call from my daughter the day before yesterday. Daddy, I had a dream last night. I really think you need to hear it. My daughter don't know, you know, um, what I'm asking the Lord. She said, I had a dream that we was inside of a house. And... Um, she said, um, I saw you praying, and, you know, I'm behind you, and you walked out the door of the house. 
and you walked outside. And she said, then immediately, I was not in the house, but I was looking at you now. So here it is. I walk out the door of the house, and where she was behind me, um, when I step out, she's now outside looking at me, and she said, God was in front of me. He was huge. And I asked him. I said, she said, Dad, you asked him, you know, you said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And, he, and she said, and God spoke to you and said, I told you 30 times. And I woke up. Now, what does that mean? Now I'm asking, what does the number 30 mean? Ministry. You see the importance of this? This is the importance. Jesus was 30 when he began his ministry. Joseph was 30. David was 30. Priests become, they step into ministry at 30. 30 is the number of ministry. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I told you 30 times. Wow. Ministry. 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 She said, Daddy, and I don't know what it means. I said, I know exactly what it means. I'm inside the house, which represents God's house, asking him what he wants me to do. I step out the door. There he is. What's that? What's his name? And, um... <laughs> right. <laughs> Actually, Chloe's name means Ephraim. It means double portion. Wow. Right. And you know what? It's true. It's what's happening. And, and I'm going to say it again. Man, if you're able to get here on Wednesday night, my God, I'm telling you, you know, you don't know what you're missing. You know, because this is what ties everything in, right. begins to tie it all in. So I told you 30 times, and people be like, what did you tell me 30 times, 30 times? You know, what did God tell me 30 times? Yeah. There's nothing to do with that. Right. 30 is the number of ministry. I told you what I want you to do, ministry. Wow. You know, so, you know that, that means don't close the doors. Wow, amen. That's what it means. This is what I've called you to do. Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> right. And here it is. It's, 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 so God's good. And listen, you know, uh, I'm excited about as we're going through this, it starts tying in for you guys. And um, yeah, it wasn't crazy today and hollering and screaming and stuff like that. But now when we go back, now when we go back and we start reading Elijah and Elisha, you know, it's like, you know, just, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's all I can tell you. Because even when, you know, and I, even when you, um, this is crazy stuff here. When you look at the mantle that Elijah cast on Elisha, and, you know, uh, it's Adoret, which goes into Adar, which goes into robes of righteousness which goes into a new body man crazy stuff and what, let me let me and I'll, I'll, put, I'll take it a little step further you think when you get to heaven you have a, a white robe up there that you're going to be wrapped in a white robe is that what you think that's a body we have a new body. The robe, your soul is going to be wrapped in, clothed in righteousness. Which is fine. Adam and Eve didn't need no clothing in the beginning because of the light that was illuminating off. The robe of righteousness, and I'm going to break it down and show it to you as a new body. Hallelujah. Young man, how did you get into the wedding? Not having the aurora huh? of the, the new body, <laughs> <laughs> the marriage. He was easily spotted out. We all clothed in a new body, and there he is in dead skin. How did you get in here with no robe, no new body? 
I'm going to take you through the scriptures and show you how the mantle that Elisha clothed himself in is the same mantle that Jesus slipped into a robe <laughs> which is crazy amazing wow. you guys let's pray and be blessed father in Jesus name Lord this earth suit Lord we can't wait to get our new heavenly suit that Paul yeah. talked about a robe of righteousness that our soul is going to be clothed in yes. with the light and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Hey, 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 you know what one of the first things that happened when Adam and Eve ate from the tree? They was clothed in the light and righteousness of God. As soon as they took a bite, ah, light went out. their light went out. Wow. And they noticed they were naked. No more glory. Wow. So immediately they needed to clothe themselves with something. Wow. I hope when you die, you have a new skin suit. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're in trouble. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.